Good afternoon, everyone. We're really pleased to have you here and uh, want to welcome you to Citrus and the Bonato Institute. I'm Camille Curtenden, Deputy Director of Citrus, and I'll be introducing our speaker this afternoon. So I want to welcome also our web viewers. All of these presentations are webcast live. Uh, also to the other Citrus campuses at UC Davis, from where our keynote speaker hails uh, the medical center, um, UC Merced and UC Santa Cruz. Um, so we invite you to um, watch remotely, or uh, the remarks will also be posted on the Citrus YouTube channel uh, shortly. So without further ado, I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Fred Myers is Associate Dean for Precision Medicine at UC Davis. Uh, he has a passion as a physician for caring for cancer patients and educating and mentoring scholars and new physicians and convening diverse groups from um, the Chair of Internal Medicine to the Vice Dean of the School of Medicine um, has led to his current focus on precision medicine. So we look forward to hearing from Dr. Myers. <clears throat> well, thanks, Camille, and good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, this uh, passion for convening diverse uh, groups has really gone way over the cliff with this Precision Health, Precision Medicine initiative. So I, I hope to uh, engage all of you today as we think a little bit about what, uh, what can be possible to improve both uh, health care as well as population health. The first slide you see really two important images. One is a gyroscope. I hope that's not too rudimentary for all of the engineers and physicists in the uh, room. But for us, the gyroscope is a really remarkable instrument that uh, is both helps with accurate navigation and accelerated navigation. And that's the essence of, pop, of precision medicine. Uh, if we want to navigate through complex health problems accurately and with a trajectory faster than we do. You'll hear that theme throughout the next uh, 30 minutes. The other image you see is really uh, the cognitive diversity uh, across the University of California's and our communities. That really, if we're going to be successful, if precision medicine is going to be more uh, than just uh, words, I think convening diverse communities from across uh, the UCs, across uh, private sector, uh, you'll hear that theme throughout this talk also, because if we don't do that, this is really not a new paradigm. This is just the same old thing dressed up differently, and, and we're really not uh, uh, committed to that. So what's our inspiration? Well, our inspiration at UC Davis is to unite UC Davis and our partners uh, our breadth of expertise to make individual health and population health more proactive, more predictive, and more precise, more accurate. In fact, it's the bringing together of these diverse teams uh, that's really the innovation uh, that's our focus at UC Davis. We want to empower and participate with individuals and communities as partners in their own wellness, so dissemination. Uh, is a key part of our model. And then finally, we, we're committed to training the next generation of data fluent and multidisciplinary professionals to maintain the sustainability of our model. Uh, uh, I was the principal investigator of our Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Med into Grad training group, and boy, did I learn a lot from our engineering students uh, as they taught me how engineers approach problems, but we were also able to bring engineering students to open heart surgery, to the cancer center, to have didactics, and for them to engage us in clinical care and in population health and to identify problems and challenges where we weren't doing as well as we could and for the engineers to go back to Citrus, to their labs and say, wait, wait, we really need to be doing things differently. They need us in clinical care and I know you do that here at Citrus on a daily basis. So, Uniting, empowering, and training is what we're all about as we evolve this model of precision health at, at UC Davis. Why would we want to do this? Well, you'll see that we want to link our research in precision medicine to improve health care and improve public health. We need to align healthcare professionals with these big data, data sets that are vital 
to clinical decision making. When I go to the cancer center and see patients, I need data at my fingertips to help me, to help inform me about the best prognostic and predictive values that I can provide my patients and their families. Mobile technology can capture critical information. We see patients in the physician's office every month, every six weeks, every four months. So much data is being lost as patient experiences in their own setting, in their home, wherever they live. Mobile technology can truly capture uh, and improve our understanding of the patient experience. We can address health from the clinic to the living room to entire populations, and we want to partner in equitable and inclusive ways with communities. None of this really matters if we don't change health disparities in this country. There needs to be an intervention to change the inequitable and in non-inclusive ways that healthcare and population health is being uh, delivered in this country and really raise the quality of care and public health and at the same time probably reduce the costs by being better at what we do. This is probably the academic medical center of the future that we still will provide complex highly specialized care with concentrated uh, uh, expertise as well as being empathetic and caring physicians as we train the next generation to deliver care across the lifespan throughout our community. But it's the, really the diverse skills and expertise of transdisciplinary teams that the Academic Medical Center can really deliver from medical students, residents, nursing students, pharmacy students, engineering students, bringing together diverse teams. If we train together, we'll be able to work together. And I think that <coughs> is likely to be the future for Academic Medical Centers while still reflecting core values of equity uh, compassion and respect uh, and use uh, strong ethical principles which we really sometimes don't pay attention to and in precision health are foundational to what we're doing. Well, so let me take you back to 1948 to maybe the, an, a great example of precision medicine and that was the Framingham study. So Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, as you see there in eastern Massachusetts, uh, was, was the focus of a really great study. At this time in 1948, cardiovascular disease, and particularly strokes and myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, was the leading cause of death in this country. People were strong, incredibly debilitated by a huge incidence of stroke. Uh, and in the Framingham cardiovascular heart study, Subjects were enrolled and followed for the next 70 years to understand the pattern of cardiovascular disease. Uh, at that time, hypertension was completely uncontrolled uh, and patients were initially followed uh, just to see the natural history of the disease and it became evident that uncontrolled hypertension, in addition to cigarette smoking and hypercholesterolemia, were the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And it was at that point then that a study was done to begin to focus on 5,000 subjects in Framingham, and it became the town that changed uh, America's heart, as they say. So over a period of time, interventions were developed, cigarette smoking reduction, control of cholesterol, and remarkably, much better control of hypertension, starting with some very basic uh, drugs in the 50s and 60s, thiazide diuretics and beta blockers onto the whole uh, compendium of drugs that we have now for the control of hypertension. And you know that in our country and in the world, the uh, morbidity and mortality of cardiovascular disease has gone down pretty significantly. We do not have hospitals full of patients who are, have strokes and are paralyzed and unable to speak anymore. And yet here we are in 2016 we don't know the diverse causes of hypertension. We don't know which patients are likely to progress to more severe hypertension. We don't know who's most likely to respond to what drugs. And we don't really understand the behavioral and environmental factors that really influence patients' abilities to adhere to these medication regimens, whether exercise, diet, and other adjuvant, uh, adjunctive uh, 
method should be used to control hypertension. So really, here we are 70 years later with, on the one hand, a, a great success story, and on the other hand, it's really rather an incomplete story. We don't really fundamentally understand uh, these multiple domains of hypertension. So maybe this is the reason why precision health, both at a population level and precision medicine at an individual level, maybe now is the right time to think about going back and, and, and looking at hypertension, cancer, asthma, lots of chronic diseases. We can sequence human genomes for a fraction of the initial cost, and we can do it in less than a day. Uh, we have smartphones and other mobile technologies that can collect patient data. We, co we measure hypertension every three or four months in the doctor's office. Not a very good reflection of how well hypertension is being controlled. Some people uh, measure their blood pressure at home, again, episodic. Uh, and not really uh, relatable to activity or to fluctuations in, in, uh, uh, in their behavior patterns. So, so we've got the ability to collect a lot more data. Most hospitals now uh, have fully uh, deployed electronic health records with an enormous amount of information that we really are only now beginning to understand how to tap into. And computing power, looking at data sets, uh, and Camille and I were talking about this, we have remarkable abilities to look at, at computing power both for genomic data sets and population data sets that if brought together could really uh, give us some insights we haven't really had in, in public health. And finally and most importantly, we have an engaged society. We have communities and society who want to be engaged in their own health and their own health care. And I would say importantly, it is the community that will prioritize what we need to study and it will be the academic centers uh, who will provide some of the mechanisms uh, to study outcomes in that situation. So now is a good time to think about what we can do in precision health that we haven't been able to do in the past. And in fact, this is a national initiative that all of you know about. In 2015, President Obama launched the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, the initial grants have been uh, awarded. The University of California Consortium is one of the initial awardees. Uh, and this will be a million person cohort of individuals to be followed over the next many, many decades with their personal data, their medical data, uh, accumulated, integrated, aligned in ways for us to really understand risk factors for illness and risk factors uh, that are threats to our wellness. Uh, we're really excited to be part of this, uh, and you'll hear more about this as San Diego, San Francisco, uh, Davis, Los Angeles, Irvine are, are really part of this uh, consortium. So now we're moving from 1948, Framingham Heart Study, to 2016 and on the National Precision Medicine Initiative. Well, there are other opportunities. So imagine it's not a child with acute leukemia. Uh, this treatment, starting in the 1950s, has been increasingly effective and increasingly toxic. So imagine now that we characterize leukemia cells uh, on the basis of their genotype and of the proteins on the surface of the cell, and we tailor treatment for acute leukemia, not based on what it looks like under the microscope, but upon its genotypic profile and the proteins on the surface of the cell so that we use targeted therapies uh, where the, the therapeutic of effectiveness is higher and the toxicity is much lower. This is happening now. This is really where precision medicine holds its uh, greatest promise. And many of you know in oncology, uh, this is one of our, our, our great uh, advantages. Uh, you also imagine a grandmother with diabetes and high blood pressure. So chronic multiple illnesses are a huge challenge in our country. A lot of people have heart failure and diabetes, often with COPD. Imagine people living on their own without any continuity of care, fatigued and unable to take their medications. But based on data from her uh, mobile data, her smartwatch, her nurse can coach her on changes in her meals, her activities, her medications in a real time, day to day basis. But this also applies to public health. So you can imagine in California, a rural community with a high rate of asthma uh, related to, to uh, air pollution, and that we could be working in that community to reduce air pollution, improve adherence to medications, and thus improve population health. This is actually uh, a real example also in an urban community in Cincinnati, 
the Children's Hospital there noticed that uh, they had a high rate of children coming to their emergency room, and it was the same children. And they were able to use their electronic health record to both identify this cohort of children uh, who were repetitively coming with asthma exacerbations and to notice that they were from the same part of Cincinnati. And so they partnered with the community and they went out to the homes of these children and found that, as you might predict, that these homes were dusty, moldy tenement buildings uh, that, of course, no amount of medication would ever uh, control that asthma. And they did uh, what any, anyone should do, and that is they threatened to sue the landlords if the... Uh, <laughs> If, if things were not improved, and, and in fact, that's exactly what happened, and the rate of asthma exacerbation uh, fell. So precision population health is a huge new opportunity, and this also links to global health. So the Gates Foundation has accumulated uh, 10 million lives uh, experience in children between the ages of zero and five, and Dr. Uh, Shasha Jumba at the Gates Foundation is the lead on this. You can read his editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine on June 30th. And they've looked at these 10 million lives uh, uh, from age zero to five, some of the children from zero to two, some from three to five. Uh, but he's created this picture of this wasting syndrome of stunted growth around the world, which accounts for hundreds of millions of children uh, having their lives impaired just when their brains are being uh, most developed, and tens of millions of children die each year from this wasting syndrome. And he's identified now with this large database both the reasons for, for this wasting syndrome, which you might uh, understand might be maternal education, diet uh, uh, and breastfeeding, uh, pollution, uh, violence, et cetera, and now thinking about what the interventions might be to reverse this. So precision health, precision medicine is nothing if this doesn't reduce health disparities, and if there's not an intervention. If we don't have an intervention, uh, then we have nothing new uh, compared to what we've had in the past. So, so this might be a way for me to tell you that, because everybody says, Fred, what's precision medicine? So precision medicine might be understanding and predicting the future our risk to wellness. I do that in my oncology practice. Uh, I see patients and families who have genetic inherited abnormalities, uh, uh, breast cancer genes, BRCA1, and, and I always have to remind our medical students that BRCA stands for Berkeley, California, because Mary Claire King uh, described that here in Berkeley, so I'm pleased to be here today. So BRCA1, uh, DNA mismatch repair in, uh, genes, and early onset colon carcinoma. So there are now genomic ways to look at risk to wellness, but there are environmental ways to look at our risk to wellness also, and we'll be talking about how to bring those together. Risk to progression. So a woman with breast cancer has, a, uh, uh, has her local regional therapy uh, with excision of the lump, and the question is, is she more or less likely to have recurrence, and how can we better judge that uh, based on her own personal characteristics and some of the genetic characterization of that cancer? And then finally, prediction of response or resistance to therapy. And we use, uh, again, targeted therapies more and more in cancer therapy, asthma, and other illnesses where we identify targets in or on the surface of cells and specific uh, uh, drugs, uh, Herceptin, Rituxan, all of these monoclonal antibodies and small molecules that really uh, target uh, treatment based on a biomarker. And biomarkers have become so important in um, targeted therapy that it's likely that the FDA will begin to set the bar very high for that uh, because biomarkers, in fact, have been misused and abused rather than used as effectively as they should be. You, you kind of know about this. Um, you open up your web browser every morning, you look at things, and there are advertisements there, aren't there? Every day there are advertisements, and they seem remarkably tailored for you. They somehow know that you're interested in vacationing in Hawaii, buying a green sweater, that somehow they're trying to increase your responsiveness to the advertisements, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to predict and increase a chance of response to therapy. That kind of big data is used every day in, in merchandising, 
we're, we're beginning to understand how we might be able to use big data to increase our responses to treatment. So if you think about that, this is really navigating very complicated areas in healthcare. We used to be able to navigate just looking at the stars for simple problems. Um, pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia. We develop maps and charts for more complicated problems. And finally, we have a compass and we have a gyroscope and GPS and finally we now have Google Earth. So we don't need precision medicine we don't need more complicated navigational tools for the simple problems in healthcare or in population health. But we do need more sophisticated navigational tools if we're going to reverse health disparities, if we're going to think about how to get vaccinations to uh, underserved communities, if we're going to engage in global health. If we're going to look at more complicated data sets, then our navigational tools need to be that, that much more sophisticated. And that's kind of the model that we're developing at Davis that I'm talking to you about today. So you think about, we characterize patients or persons in uh, the electronic health record, in hospitalized patients, or persons who live in our communities, uh, in the Central Valley, in urban settings. We characterize persons by individuals and by those data sets. And now in precision medicine, we're beginning to look at markers of health and of illness. And I've talked about a couple of those markers, breast cancer genes, genes that predict response to therapy. Imaging, imaging is a huge marker. So, so in fact, this is these are genetic markers. These are persons and the link between persons and genetics, if you will, is this emerging area of genomics. And we think that genomics helps us to both be more precise and accurate in prognosis and in response to therapy. But you know that as important as our genetic code is, our future is not defined only by our genetic code. Our zip code is just as important. So environmental influences of health are extraordinarily important to consider. So your internal environment, your microbiome, the diverse set of bacteria that make up your gut, your external environment, pollution, diet, uh, social determinants of health, level of education. These are much more important, frankly, in determining the health of individuals and of, of communities uh, than your genetic code. But these days we talk about the interaction between markers and the environment and we call in individuals we call that gene environment interaction and I think that's this emerging sophisticated area uh, where we understand that people do have susceptibility to illness or to maintain their wellness based on their genetic makeup but also based on their exposome what they've been exposed to during their lifetime and where they're currently living and how do we measure that how do we understand what their exposure history looks like and how that inter interacts with some of their markers of, of illness or wellness. And finally, behavioral health and the integration of behavioral health and physical health is, is, has finally been recognized as something very understudied in the past. People with significant mental illness have a lifespan 25 years less than those without mental illness in this country. So if the average lifespan for most of us is now in our 70s, people with significant mental illness die in their 40s and 50s. This is a remarkable problem identified in large data sets and anyone who sees these patients will tell you uh, that they have uncontrolled hypertension, poor control of their diabetes, risk of suicide, violence, etc. And so this is, this is really I think a full picture of what we're trying to do at UC Davis to better understand both precisely medical care and population health. It's not clear that if you look at just one of these that this will be uh, any great advantage over what we've done in the past. There's lots of controversy in the literature over whether genomics and cancer medicine, for example, precision medicine, will really change exactly what we're doing. We're sequencing a lot of cancers hoping to find individualized treatment for each one of those cancers, it's not clear that that's exactly how it's going to work out. Uh, most of our advancers in cancer therapy, which have been remarkable over the last decade, 
have been, have been because we found common driver mutations and, and drugs that can affect those uh, across these different uh, uh, cancers. So, so we think that this is a much more robust way to think about both individual health as well as population health. There's a lot of overlap in precision medicine with some of the other things that people talk about. So we could have the same discussion about global health and about a lot of the things that you see. What are the environmental influences? What are the behavioral influences that change health throughout this world, uh, not just in hospitals or in, in, in the United States? Uh, we're very committed to One Health. One Health encompasses not only human health, but veterinary health and the impact of agriculture and the environment at UC Davis. And it's the close approximation of our school of medicine, our school of nursing, our ag school and our veterinary school that really allows us to think in a more holistic, broad way about these different domains. And finally, uh, none of this matters if we don't improve health care uh, in population health. And so the, the learning health care system, as, as discussed by the Institute of Medicine, is really an important idea that we need to translate the research of precision medicine and precision health into daily care test it and then sustain it. These overlaps really, I think, bring precision medicine in a much more robust way to influence the kind of health and health care that we want in this country, uh, particularly to reduce uh, health disparities. So the only way this is going to happen is if we really do embrace a culture of collaboration. That it, it, This will not be done by individuals. This will not even be done by individual groups. That it will really be, if you will, the University of California's working together with the private sector and with our diverse communities uh, to really change health and health care. Is there an example where we might look at that? Well, actually, there is. This is what NASA does. Put this one up for the engineers in the group. Uh, so at NASA, everybody focuses on the astronaut. And when you think about who that is at NASA, it's, sure, it's physicians and as exercise physiologists, but, but look at all the engineers who all have to work together, communication engineers, hardware engineers, software engineers, aerospace systems engineers, as well as psychologists. They all work together. They all bring their diverse talents to focus on the wellness and safety of the astronaut. And you know uh, that this is not to be taken for granted, not only the safety, but being uh, in space for long periods of time changes most of your physiology, your cardiovascular physiology, your bone biology. Uh, there are remarkable changes that, that have to be considered. And so everybody works together uh, on the astronaut. We think that the same thing can happen in precision medicine. But think about the diverse disciplines that we have available to us that might be able to focus on a project, a cancer, hypertension, asthma, uh, for you in the audience. So if we focus on a person, we would bring together our professional schools, our, our graduate students, our postdocs, our hospitals and clinics, our, our robust basic sciences, our cancer center, our poverty center. I want to emphasize that we really need the humanities to join us, that the, the behavioral aspects of this, the organizational aspects of this are critical as well as our community partners and, and the private sectors and other universities. If we can really think about those, in, those groups and individuals coming together to focus on the health of an individual, of a family, or of a population, we can really make much more rapid advances in a precise and accurate fashion than we have in the past. And if you buy into the idea that we all could work together, if we all could come together from these diverse backgrounds to collaborate, uh, then you understand uh, the kind of resources that we're trying to build uh, and put together to build these powerful teams. That we think that, that it's possible to put together proof of concept projects to bring together diverse individuals, these transdisciplinary teams, to focus on hypertension, uh, uh, young children's health, a specific cancer, uh, 
we, we clearly are going to have to invest in new technology, not only in the kind of mobile health we already have or the big data that we already have, but how to interface all these different data sets in ways that we can understand phenotype, personal characteristics, genotype, environmental influences, and behavioral health. That's a remarkable amount of computing power uh, that other people have not really uh, uh, been able to think about. And then finally, we're very committed to workforce development and we envision uh, a training grant uh, for professional students, graduate students, and postdocs uh, who would be able to train together, understand each other's diverse backgrounds, and eventually work together uh, in this fashion to solve problems, uh, which includes um, uh, working with our community partners. So, our center, we envision, would unite all of UC Davis and our partners. Uh, it includes both precision medicine and precision public health. So we like to think of this as a center for precision health, not just medicine, but also public health. We think that this is the ultimate team science and that these teams are going to navigate very complex factors and domains that really contribute to health disparities, the runaway cost of health care and population health in our country, but that this could really lead to both improved health care and population health in the United States. So that's kind of our conceptual model that we're using at Davis. We think that it's a novel way to bring uh, people together, uh, and we think it's testable uh, by putting together uh, these teams that haven't been put together before. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is about the new um, treatments that are now being developed that are understanding um, individuals' phenotypes. Um, and I'll use the example of asthma, that we're now looking at our asthma patients as ones that um, we do blood work. We see, oh my god, it's eosinophils or it's IgE. Um, so if it's eosinophils, then we say, oh, okay, maybe Nucala, a new medication, you know, that's injected quite expensive right yep. now, but yep. is tackling the development of eosinophils. The issue is, um, on one hand, it's effectiveness, which I think, you know, is, is now being studied. But what about for those who stay on these medicines that we develop? Um, for the long term. Is there a part of our um, long term trending looking at what it means to be so specific in how we're approaching, you know, a particular um, disease? And, um, you know, are we thinking, for instance, I think in, in this particular instance, we are therefore leaving a group of people who are on Nucala susceptible to parasites yep. because they no longer can generate the white blood cells that are needed. So is there, um, can you tell me the degree to which resources are being, are paying attention to some of this so that we know that we're, we have a little bit greater sight down the tunnel <laughs> around what might lie ahead after these successful treatments? I think it's a great example. I spent two hours with my asthma people a couple of weeks ago as they kind of discussed exactly what you're discussing and some of these newer treatments for asthma and this emerging collaboration between several University of Californias to, to address that. So let me break the, your question down into a number of different parts. So asthma is not one disease. It's very heterogeneous. Uh, and different patients are going to get different therapies based on on the different uh, biology uh, of, the, of the asthma, and we're only now beginning to understand some of the different cytokines. So that leads clearly then to the understanding that we need uh, completely different but ongoing clinical trials. That you can't, it's not gonna be one size fits all. And uh, so that's the second piece of this. And, and then the third is 
the biomarkers have to be both for acute treatment but also for chronic follow-up. And, and I'm very concerned, as you are, that leaving people on these long-term uh, immune, that you could call them immune modulators, but I think you're classifying it more as immune blockers, as preventing our immune system from working effectively, could lead, just as we do in cancer, to more opportunistic infections. So, so the biomarkers are going to be important both in terms of understanding the severity of the asthma, but then the biomarkers also have to guide the different treatments both acutely and they're going to be different because people are going to respond to different medications almost certainly, and including whether they're children or adults. And then also the biomarkers have to be able to tell us when we can stop treatment. We just cannot, it, it's not a value to continue that. So, so for me and for some of my colleagues, we're pretty good clinically. We understand how to see patients. We understand how to construct clinical trials. We understand how to stratify patients based on the severity of their asthma and some of the phenotypic characteristics, but we need scientists to work with us to develop biomarkers that are linked to the mechanism of the asthma, but also the mechanism of response to, to treatment. And then we need those biomarkers to be able to tell us when we can stop treatment. So asthma is a, a great challenge, and, and we've gone from kind of here's your inhaled steroids, here's a few other things for everybody to understanding that's just not very effective. Is that response? Other questions? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is, I, I'm very amazed by um, all the progress you guys have made, especially uh, precision medicine and um, I um, the point you made about the intersection between global health one health precision health uh, medicine uh, it will require a lot of time and energy and cost my question is about cost is anybody addressing how much money um, or how is going to be funded in the future for things like this well, I think and it almost ties to the asthma question about cost there has to be a value proposition here that this cannot be about spending more and more money without improving quality. Uh, and in ultimately, if cost goes up, it will go up less rapidly than the quality of care. Uh, and I think the university people need, who, who are very committed to measuring outcomes have to be the strong partners in the people who are in the communities doing the work. Because you're right, if we're just doing this as a whole new, if you will, industry without looking at outcomes, then, then we will have achieved nothing. Uh, and I think what you're alluding to is we spent a lot of time working really hard and with great altruism to look at global health, uh, but we haven't always, A, had the kind of outcomes we want, and in talking to, I'm not a expert in global health, but some of my colleagues are, we haven't really brought to bear those kind of teams. So we have some people working on infection, some people working on water sources, some people working on diet, but why can't those people work collaboratively to really uh, change that in a sustainable fashion? So I, I think your point is good. And um, again, this concept is testable that maybe we can make, uh, if we're organized differently, if we converge our resources in ways that we haven't aligned people, maybe we could make a difference rather than working as hard as we have and spending as much money. I, I'd be anxious, anxious to hear a response to that. Is that what you're thinking? I think you should think about cost. You know, in clinical medicine, you work for the county, so that we call that the value proposition, right? It's quality over cost. And, and in America, as a generalization, quality is lower than it should by, be and cost is higher. And, and some of that is the inefficiencies of our, our system, and some of it is that we don't have data at our fingertips to do what's right for the right patient at the right time. So none of us want to see the... GDP of this country continue to rise in health care above you know, the current 18 percent. The federal government deficit over the last decade is two-thirds of which is due to health care. We, we really have an obligation, I think, to provide high-quality care at less cost. We hope 
If precision medicine doesn't do that, if precision medicine doesn't inform higher quality care, then we will not have done anything. Um, so my question is, electronic medical records is driving a sea change in the way epidemiology is looked at in terms of healthcare, specifically predictive algorithms use for changing the way doctors practice and the protocols they operate. How much of what you're talking about in precision medicine is really that use of formulas in terms of processing in the EMRs? And, yeah. and how is that affecting what you're talking about? So I think the question is, is really uh, about electronic health records and will those algorithms, will those be at the fingertips of physicians and other clinicians to deliver higher quality uh, care. I think it's a hypothesis that's not been proven yet, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is that the, as currently constructed, most electronic health records don't allow us to pull out data to see how we're doing, so new data sets are being uh, committed. And the other is that there are so many physician alerts that they're more distracting than they are guiding. So. Uh, uh, there will be algorithms based on our, the patients that we're seeing, um, and we all hope that the big data will drive that, uh, but we haven't seen that really implemented in an effective uh, fashion yet. I think it's, a, it's an aspirational goal. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, how is this work that you're doing and the teams that you're bringing together um, interfacing with the people, the groups that are working on shared decision making and decision um, aids and decision support counseling so that the patient has knowledge of where this is going for their treatment? Yeah, I, your, your point is a good one and in fact patient engagement Patients are partners in this all along at, at our institution, Kathy Kim, and the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute are intimately involved in this. Kathy's one of the leaders of the Precision Medicine Initiative at Davis and statewide. So that we think that uh, patient engagement, if we again don't have that, then we're not really doing precision. We're not changing the quality of care uh, through this type of research. So. Uh, uh, your point is right. We, we don't yet have the kind of engagement in the community we want, but I think Kathy and, and others in the group uh, understand Nick Anderson, others need to, to be doing that. And, and are we, do we have them together? Yes. In our organizational model, Kathy sits at the table with us as well as the patients and persons that she represents. So we, I didn't go into it, but our organizational model at Davis brings together the hospital and clinics, it brings together the nursing school, it brings together the medical school, it brings together environmental scientists, and it brings together uh, genomicists, and it also brings together the, the groups of individuals who have the deepest roots in the community. We are not yet building patient decision aids, we will be building patient decision aids. And I think a lot of that has to do with, in cancer, some of our patient navigators uh, and some of our um, uh, healthy survivorship and uh, where the patients are really driving this. So yes is the answer. We, we are, but we will be more so. It's an interesting question because precision medicine on the one hand could be viewed as research, but I think it's so intimately tied and needs to be driven by improved care driven by patient needs, that it, it's, it's increasingly difficult. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's a tight weave, isn't it? To do them separately is to, is to not achieve what we want to achieve. Please join me in thanking Dr. Myers. Thank you.